पाक्सी यूनिट सॉलिटन सॉलिफेनस इन आई मीन Nitesh, last time what happened is I was having an informal talk with Bhavtesh in AINU clinics and everything went online. Okay, you need solitan. Uh, sir, we are live now, sir. Solid penetration. Okay. Nitesh, having an informal talk with Bhavtesh in AINU clinics and everything went online. स्ट्रिक्चर so today we have got nine stalwarts from eight countries who will be guiding us what to do and when to do in structure urethra we have got expert none other than dr sanjay kulkarni sir who will be commenting after the after end of each session the whole idea and the concept the mastermind behind the entire program is dr sanjay kulkarni sir and dr pankaj joshi sir without wasting much of time i will hand over the entire proceeding to dr pankaj over to you sir thank you thank you nitesh and thank you alto for this wonderful opportunity in fact when the covid started the first program we did was for alto and i distinctly remember it a short brief about alto it is the urology education to the learning of others and this is the trainer trainee model whatever we learn we have to pass on to the next generation so this group has about 7500 members and one of the most important founder member is nitesh so uh, uh, i know everyone knows nitesh but he is so busy operating from morning 6 till 10 every day wonderful laparoscopic surgeon he does amazing donor nephrectomies and then plays badminton and whenever i tell him he want to do a program he makes himself available in between the surgery so nitesh thanks a lot to you a lot credit to you for educating people right before covid started uh, we have a wonderful opportunity here uh, to have people from all across the globe uh, it is always a pleasure for me i say that uh, we have the siu president and you all get to see him occasionally but i get to see my siu president and my mentor every day for perhaps the longest time in the day so i am i am more privileged uh, he is the master guru he is teachers to teacher and sometimes we call him a urologist to the urologists because he would repair uh problems created by uh atrogenic problems from his friends all across i think he has uh, crafted many recon urologists across the world set up recon masters we have paksi here devang uh, justin will be in the next program and uh, i don't think so anyone else would have done urethroplasties in 41 countries i tell him that perhaps uh, if you have human beings in antarctica uh, that's the only continent left for him uh we have professor arun chawla he is going to join us shortly because this is another meeting he is the professor and head at urology at uh, kmc manipal an excellent organization far ahead of others in india he is also in charge of the indian school of urology we do a uh, lot of programs training residents and urologists in india he is an eminent teacher uh, a small memory about him he invited me in his room in uh, ucon in kochi last year uh because i was not able to find a room when i checked in the hotel so when i entered trust me his room was full of printed manuscripts of urethroplasty there were at least 60 papers lying there and he was reading all of them for the next session amazing i invite professor keith rook um, uh, uh, one of the stalwarts in urethral reconstruction he is exactly 12 hours away from us so it is 11:30 12 o'clock in the night for him is professor at alberta university he heads the fellowship committee of gurs and that's a lot of responsibility because the entire burden of training fellows lies on his shoulder uh, i don't think amongst this group anyone has more than 1500 citations to his credit and that is going to be dr keith he is an innovator recently we saw his technique of neatal stenosis and director of fellowship welcome keith for this pro to this program and i'm sure you're going to enjoy it 
uh it's always a it's always a woman power which makes the difference and we have evelyn she started very early in urology she has been to pune thrice for the workshop every time she comes with a different team member so she trains the team member to taking grafts and or visualizing us when we are in the ot she headed the department at steve boko pretoria hospital currently she is pursuing phd so at this uh, status stretcher of your career when you want to do phd it's a lot of efforts she is an ambitious and an excellent surgeon huge fan, fan following works for the needy uh, she had invited prof last year and me to pretoria and it was wonderful seeing her team members we also have stella ivas uh, a very few would be able to write in their slides ucl london i think it's one of the most prestigious places to work and be attached so she's an associate professor a very close colleague always helpful if i send her one whatsapp the reply comes back in a minute so stella uh, recon is your karma and here is your opportunity to speak on our topic of non transacting which you have uh, seen uh, developed so well at ucl far east where the sun rises is our next colleague akio haraguchi he's a close friend i met him in nepal in one of the workshop uh, he is associated uh, as an associate professor with the japanese defense medical college and perhaps one of the only one who's doing recon in japan is a board member of gurs innovator somehow akio i have been the reviewer for majority of your papers and it is always wonderful to know about you much before it comes to the world congratulations for winner of the excellent academy award of the japanese society Faisal was a fellow at Kulkarni Hospital, and my my, look, he's grown. We call him the king of urethroplasty in the Middle East. Uh, he is in Kuwait. He is mentor to many of his fellows. He helps the education committee at Kuwait Urology. So I think that's a lot of responsibility, and he's also the founder member of ISRU. While doing this, he's actually taking care of his patients, and he is going to join us shortly. Devang, uh, an astute surgeon, also a part of the Kulkarni Institute. in hindi we say meri mumbai meri jaan attitude he is always lively smiling doing something he migrated to australia and now he is an associate prof at the university of queensland griffith and southern queensland what's good about devang is taking inspiration from prof he started his own reconstructive personal setup catering only to the patients with stricture urethra and he wants to have an helipad there so sure when australia opens up we want to be there devang congratulations for that and the most important mark uh, man in the in the southeast asian continent paksi satyagra he was such a shy colleague when he came to kulkarni hospital people come here for fellowship he came here only for 3 months he watched and he has built his super kingdom in urethroplasty back home in indonesia he started very early and he has conquered his dreams more importantly a fit athlete a hotelier he owns a hotel and is also a musician paksi welcome to the program so without wasting any time i may request evelyn to present her topic on when and how to do a dbiu as far as urethra stricture is concerned evelyn over to you thank you thank you for that kind introduction uh, are my slides on or am i must just share my screen please share your screen evelyn okay okay when we talk about the uh, you know direct visual uh, incision what i wanted to do now is to go back to the first slide this is not my first slide so i think i would want to go back to the first slide i'll end the show yeah there we go thank you yeah then it makes i'm happy now yeah i'm going to talk about direct vision internal urethrotomy and i'm going to declare you know that i am now more biased towards doing urethroplasties after having been to pune and realizing the outcome of you know doing a urethroplasties but the issue is that there is still a role for doing dvius it is a first line of treatment for most urethral strictures 
It can be done under general, regional, or local anesthesia. So for those people who don't have resources, you find that it is one of the things that can be used as well as a temporizing uh, issue. I want to state that, you know, in South Africa, we have got unique uh, problems when it comes to strictures. You know, things like HIV infection, sexually transmitted infection, poverty-related disease, violence, and actually, we, I mean, our statistics are quite high, you know, except now when you look in the COVID, in the COVID era, it's relatively lower, non-communicable diseases, and we see late presentation. So it is one of the things that, you know, is quite worrisome. We see the stricture disease being a debilitating neurological condition. It's very common. And some people will present, you know, in urinary tension and with renal failure. The impact on quality of life is quite high and also on fertility. So urethral strictures we know can be even in females, in transgender patients, but I'm going to focus on doing DVIU in male patients. Uh, the issue which we need to, you know, as urethroplasty uh, surgeon is that we do realize that a urethral stricture disease has got a wide range of scarring pathology. So it's quite difficult to standardize surgical treatment, but the success rate which is being reported in both uh, DVIU and also urethroplasties, you can see the range between 14, 0.3 and 87. This is too wide. So there's still, you know, a room for improvement. There is a classification that we have now. It's in the newer uh, EAU guidelines. Uh, I think it's published this year that the severity, you know, of urethral stricture tightness is not the same. We can basically classify it as, you know, low grade and high grade strictures. I know these are the cases where, you know, Prof usually a uh, Kulkarni would tell you that, you no, know, you need to look. Some strictures you can put in a ureteroscope. Some you may not be able, but you can put a guide wire. And some you may not even manage with a guide wire, but you can be able maybe to use methylene blue. And some you can't at all. So this is where you that you clear practical classification implies, like where you can start with the low grade strictures, low French. And then high grade, once it starts from four to 10, nearly obliterative and obliterative strictures. I must say in our setting, we see a lot of obliterative strictures. I think when uh, Prof was here, saw a lot of such cases. And that is what I'm actually focusing a lot you know, on my PhD. So the complications that are there from the stricture this can be life threatening because of the severity or duration. And I mean, we all know what are the things that one can get, you know, the infections, uh, bladder stones, epididymocytes, prostitis, hydronephrosis, and sepsis. The issue is that when one is doing a DVIU, the important thing when doing that is not to treat it as a clean condition. So it's important to give antibiotics for that matter. And usually what I recommend is that we have to follow the guidelines, not more mainly on prophylactic, but on therapeutic antibiotic usage. The age of the patients that we see with urethral strictures, uh, I always want to know what is the parity, you know, what work do they do, educational level, the wish, you know, to parent and sexual functioning. Very important, even if when one is only considering to do an optic. I should say, because we are in a resource cast setting, we see this being a common procedure, which is left for that junior doctor. And with the complications that can come, it's a procedure which there's a need for supervision. And we don't have you know, clear outcome data. Most of the data that is presented is more on a, you know, retrospective analysis, not prospective. And I think we need that. Because failed DVIU may worsen the scar tissue formation and make urethroplasty relatively more difficult. So in failed DVIU, I always you know, recommend that we need to look at open urethroplasty as the current way of managing any failed single DVIU. Otherwise, the likelihood to fail again is much higher and the cost effectiveness is definitely, it disappears as a result. So can we compare urethroplasty with a, you know, a optic or not? The issue is we cannot compare. There's some element of bias because of the choice of the strictures that we'll do only optic and those that we will do urethroplasty. But I should mention that with the current, uh, you know, 
knowledge that the person may have, you may find that some are more biased doing optic because it's relatively maybe easier to do or for economic reasons. I mean, in private in South Africa, if you have to do a urethroplasty, looking at the theater time, for instance, it costs on average around 70,000 rands. So you can see the difference in how people can choose. How do we do uh, uh, the procedure? There are many options that we have. You know, you are talking about laser, uh, Dr. Pankaj. That's one of the things with people may come and say, no, I want laser, even if they don't understand what it is, because it sounds good, can be done on bipolar. But the cases I do, I use a cold knife. Here on the screen, you can see the different shapes, you know, that one goes. I usually prefer the straight one in a relatively tighter stretcher, because one can cut a, a in an, you know, when you are going in, in an anti-grade fashion, and then the, the curved one, when one can be able to go in, you cut, you know, backwards. So these are the options that one has. Uh, but the issue is that we need to appreciate the heterogeneity of the cases that are there. With these different types of uh, knives to use, there is no, you know, a difference in the outcome. It actually has to depend with one's, you know, ability to use and availability of the tool. So what I wanted to just mention is on, you know, the difference that is there, the patency that is there, that the patency rate varies considerably between eight and 77% after one has done EVIU. And this is where I like actually mentioning that why is there a difference? Because most of the cases as well, it's more of retrospective, you know, cohort series. We need to look at what is happening in prospective setup because we may be comparing strictures which are not necessarily the same. So there are complications uh, with a cold knife and we need to, to appreciate that. But what we should also uh, note is that when you compare the cold knife uh, procedure and urethroplasty, most people would say that erectile functioning is better after. But I think it has to do with the, you know, the grading of the stricture that one yeah. has done. Ask that he has my stamp. Good stamp yeah. Yeah. Okay, the recommendation that are with the recent EAU guidelines is that do not do a, a direct a DVIU for penal strictures. For strictures that are longer than two centimeters, one can perform it in a stricture less than two centimeters, but in a non-obliterative stricture. You can perform it uh, for a short you know, segment recurrent stricture after urethroplasty. You can use any of the knives that we talked about, the hot or cold or bipolar, depending on what e efficiency you have. Let's look at a clinical scenario where you, a patient comes in maybe with overflow incontinence, and then from there, you do a sauna. They've got such a high post-voiding residual. The next thing that on routine will do is we'll go and do a scope to look what is happening. These are, for me, are the nice to have things that, you know, positioning in lithotomy, having the optic knife, having a guide wire or a ureteric catheter, on-table urethrogram, I like having that available, suprapubic catheter on board, dilators, and having a catheter with a catheter introducer. This is, you know, the standard setting that I have in, in my theater where I will have, you know, the monitor and on this side, which is not showing on the photo, it will be uh, my, my uh, X-ray view and then the CM on top. What I want to say is that just seeing this lumen like this, it's usually tempting to go in and cut, you know, but the issue is look at this, it's very white. We have to appreciate the difference in the tissue. This was somebody who already had a urethroplasty before. And this is the on-table urethrogram. I mean, this is not a case that can be managed with, a, with an optic at all. So it was booked for an open procedure. And this is another case actually uh, done recently. You can see how the change in the lumen is. And already from the scope, even if it looks patent, he had overflow incontinence. One can see how white you know, the tissue is. And it was easy for me to just put in a, a guide wire uh, in there. But the way I could feel that the guide wire is, you know, turning, you know, it's not going straight. So I decided, no, let me uh, do an on-table uh, urethrogram. The patient was still, you know, having overflow incontinence. Look at what I see with the on-table urethrogram. So I find it very important to have 
this, you know, when I'm having cases uh, on the table, even if it's with the first uh, optic case, because one can be able to decide. So I put in a supra cubic, and then I decided that no, I'm going to do an open for him. So it is recommended for those uh, uh, cases which is short. Well, can we compare, uh, you know, DVIU with dilatation? Not really. I think uh, the main thing that is the the recommended dilatation of short non-obstructive strictures and DVIU is that it's not, you know, common commonly done and vision is more important. So the success rate of DVIU is better when comparing with the dilatation and it depends on complexity. I usually bring dilatation as self-dilatation, but not as, you know, the, as therapeutic for the patient. Already the person will have had an optic and then after that we can look at self-dilatation. And in a systematic review, it was found that, you no. Know, when somebody is doing intermittent uh, self dilatation, followed up in between eight and 24 months, the stricter recurrence was reduced in men who were doing a self dilatation. So there's still an option for that. But the question which Prof, I remember always would ask is would you want to do that to yourself, you know, to put in catheters on yourself, you know? So it's not comfortable. Patients are not happy with that. And it, it's actually one of the things that, you know, can make one relatively unfamous with the people that you treat. So I think one should have a relatively high threshold to let people do self dilatation. Are there any predictors of urethral stricture after endoscopic urethrotomy? In this uh, publication, uh, it was that, you know, the length of the stricture is the biggest uh, predictor of whether the optic urethrotomy will be successful or not. If the length is less than one centimeter, the success rate is better. But there are other things that we need to look at. The tightness, the location, like penal strictures, no. The number of strictures, previous intervention, and the cost, because those, all of those give you know, different type of scarring. The options of self-dilatation after I've already talked about is that you know, uh, it may be successful, but it's not one of the things where you get compliance. There's been other things which have been mentioned, like the use of steroids, metomycin C in installation. But I'm thinking that one of the things that we have to look at is when you have got a patient, let the patient look at the expectations that your patient has before you look at anything else. So, and also having a low threshold to do urethroplasty. This is one of the EAU guidelines uh, on flowchart to use on patients. But I think this you can check uh, in the current guidelines and go through it. But for me, the important thing is first, page, first uh, uh, you know, when the person is presenting the first time, doing the scope, having on table urethrogram, and then from there deciding whether can it be managed endoscopically or it needs an open procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. That was a nice flamboyant talk equivalent to your practice. And you brought up many points. So majority of the world lives around Asia, <clears throat> about two thirds of the population. And it's very important to have guidelines which cater to the entire world. And being ahead of time is very important. So the Indian guidelines chaired by Dr. Kulkani are much more, much earlier before the EAU guidelines. Nothing taking away from them, but that is a fact and it won't change. Devang, uh, though Australian is Indian by heart and a very close friend, so I have invited Devang. Can you just sum up the important aspects of the Indian guidelines, which are now used in the SAC countries for management of strictures? Devang, I'm going to stop uh, uh, Evelyn's screen share. Now you can share the screen. please. Uh, I'd like to um, take this opportunity to thank uh, Pankaj and Dr. Kokani to invite me to this talk and look forward to um, presenting this talk. So, So we're talking about the urethral stricture um, guidelines and uh, as uh, Pankaj and uh, um, Evelyn have uh, illustrated before that a lot of it depends upon the type of stricture, depends upon the position of stricture, the length of stricture and the etiology. So I'll simply um, define the urethra and the anterior and posterior urethra, the anterior being the fossa navicularis, the penile and the bulbar, and then the posterior urethra coming more to the um, bladder neck um, and the membrane bulbar junction. 
again, uh, the idea about the urethra, it's a tube in a tube and uh, um, the concept of any guideline or any management options depend upon the preservation of blood supply to this urethra alongside the etiology. So this is the paper we're talking about, uh, which is uh, free to download from the internet. Uh, it's uh, also on PubMed and essentially it's a um, it's a guideline on how to manage each of these strictures. And I'll break that down through my talk between the anterior and the posterior urethra. So we've, we've had a talk from uh, Dr. Evelyn about the endoscopic management and uh, dilatation or DVIU. Again, most of us reconstructive urologists um, would talk about the fact that this is more or less as predicted in the past, having a very high uh, successful outcome is not as good as we think it was. Um, most of us agree that, you know, the similar results between dilatation and DVIU and cutting a urethra with DVIU might increase the length of the stricture and might make um, urethroplasty more uh, difficult in the, fu uh, in the future. More or less, it's pretty much depend upon how the, um, uh, the urethra is placed within the um, spongiosum and looking at the different aspects of the urethra. Uh, there's very hardly any spongiosum in the penile urethra, so it makes it hard if you were to cut a stricture in that region. Uh, we don't have any firm evidence to suggest that intraurethral injections uh, help, so they're not recommended at this stage. Nonetheless, there is a study ongoing, which is a robust study, so we'll um, look at the results of that uh, in the near future. So in endoscopic, uh, you have a dilatation or a DVI, and I'll go through each uh, stricture part of it as well. So in the anterior urethra, what we do know is um, you've got the fossa navicularis uh, strictures and the penile urethral strictures. In the fossa navicularis, uh, dilatation or DVIU is really not recommended because it doesn't have any long-term efficacy, long-term outcome. Uh, Meatotomy, which is literally just laying the urethra open, might work in lichen sclerosis, but um, uh, not in lichen sclerosis, but in lichen sclerosis strictures, you really don't want to lay the urethra open because it just promotes uh, the lichen sclerosis further in the penile and subsequently the bulba urethra worsening your stricture. So the options there are a buccal mucosal graft, um, which is the preferred option as a dorsal inlay without having to mobilize the urethra and incising the plate and putting a stricture, uh, putting a graft in the stricture itself. In non-lichen sclerosis, there are options of using a um, either a propitial graft or a propitial flap. In the penile urethral strictures um, of the anterior urethra, again, um, as I uh, said before, the uh, urethra, which is a tube in a tube, there is very hardly any corpus spongiosum. It is best to avoid um, an internal urethrotomy because more or less you will enter the sponge and make the stricture worse. Uh, dilatation along with CISC is not curative and it's only intended to buy time um, for patients who might eventually land up having a urethroplasty. The urethroplasty options uh, depend again upon the etiology. You could use a, a one or a two stage urethroplasty. As far as lichen sclerosis is concerned, what we've realized is that doing it two stage might make it a three, might make it a four stage urethroplasty. And in fact, the urethral stricture might worsen with the lichen sclerosis if laid open. So the best option in that situation is to use a buccal mucosal graft and try and do it in one stage if possible. Bulbar strictures. Um, now these strictures, we divide them into either traumatic or non-traumatic. Uh, with the traumatic, there are options of anastomotic or augmented anastomotic using a graft, um, such as a buccal graft, especially in the dorsal aspect of the urethra. Um, I know Stella's gonna talk a bit more about the non-transacting in short uh, traumatic strictures. Um, and that could be uh, very well utilized in a very short stricture. In the non-traumatic ones, um, again, this is one aspect where one single dilatation or DV DVIU in a short stricture may work. Again, the long-term um, patency rates are not as great as we thought earlier they were. In fact, if uh, we look at the paper published um, in America, um, the patency rates long-term are about 10%. Um, those who go on to have a urethroplasty, and we'll hear subsequent talks on the options, which would include a non-transacting or a dorsal or ventral um, approach. And uh, sometimes we need to have a double face or two graphs in very uh, obliterative strictures as well. 
What are the special conditions in anterior urethra? Uh, these are the panurethral strictures, and I think by far the best option is the procedure which Dr. Kulkani himself has described, which is the pinwheel inversion, one sided dissection with um, either two buckle grafts uh, or a uh, lingual graft can be used as well um, to uh, repair these strictures. Most likely, these strictures are due to lichen sclerosis, and therefore, graft is more useful. In those for non lichen sclerosis, one can use a long uh, flap, um, which uh, can be harvested from the prepucial skin. For failures, a ventral inlay is preferred. Um, when you're doing non lichen sclerosis cases, uh, they can be done in two stage. Uh, I still prefer a one stage procedure because that's what the patient expects is to have one procedure rather than have the urethra left open for three to six months. Uh, and that can be quite uh, cosmetically debilitating for the patient itself. So that's where the um, anterior urethral strictures come in. There's one final uh, um, aspect, which is the hypospadias. And as we know, uh, hypospadias has the most amount of um, uh, procedures described in the literature. Uh, but if I put it into very simple, um, simplistic view, uh, you have the fossa navicularis strictures, and then you have the penile strictures. Um, the dorsal inlay, uh, whether in a one stage or a two stage works, we, uh, we've recently, along with Dr. Kokani, uh, described the um, two uh, stage with putting the graft in the second stage as described in the picture. Um, again, I would like to highlight this is a retractor, which I use in my setup and uh, I have imbibed that from Dr. Kokani's unit. It's a very uh, uh, good for doing these sort of procedures. Jumping onto the uh, posterior urethra, and um, this is an MRI depiction of the posterior urethra, which essentially shows that the injury is membrane or bulbar. Um, and the, the best approach uh, would be to initially put a suprapubic catheter and then delay uh, the definitive urethroplasty in an acute trauma setting so that the patient can recover from their injuries. Um, some centers still do prefer performing an early realignment. Um, it uh, brings the two ends of the urethra closer to each other, so subsequently it might be easier to find the proximal end. Nonetheless, if a false passage is created, uh, then it makes uh, life much harder. So uh, most reconstructive units around the world prefer a suprapubic catheter and a delayed repair. The way it's repaired is a progressive perineal approach going through each of the steps um, of urethral mobilization, uh, corporal um, separation, um, inferior pubectomy, uh, subsequently a combined abdominal perineal approach with a posterior pubectomy and an omental wrap of um, the urethra, uh, trying to bridge the gap between the proximal and the distal ends. The most complicating factor in this procedure, I think, is um, the finding the proximal end and assessing the grab, uh, which sometimes can be misleading. In patients who have had multiple procedures and have had uh, disruption of their blood supply, um, they can have uh, a condition called as bulbar urethral necrosis, in which case a prepucial skin tube is the preferred option. Again, uh, this is a very simplistic overview of the posterior urethra. There are quite complex uh, issues here. They could be erectile urethral fistulas. They could have injuries in children, complex injuries such as women or previously failed repairs. I think that is uh, best um, uh, left into um, referral centers who deal with this all the time. One uh, other thing that I uh, would face a lot of in uh, Australia, and I believe the same would happen in various countries where prostate cancer incidence is quite high, uh, we see um, radiation-induced strictures. Now, they could be due to external beam radiation, low-dose brachytherapy, high-dose brachytherapy, and the newer ones we're seeing is a salvage radiation after initial external beam radiation therapies. I like to say, look, radiation is good when it really works, and it's really, really, really bad when it doesn't work. What I mean by that is all of these strictures are, uh, are pretty complex. Uh, the, there's very poor blood supply. There is quite a uh, bit of tissue ischemia. There's a lot of scarring. On top of that, the sphincteric complex is very close, and hence there's a high risk of complications from these, um, uh, from these uh, stricture repairs. I would suggest the first option is uh, to have a one single dilatation and see what happens. 
If these patients become incontinent, then you have to counsel them well about future incontinence. The urethroplasty results are quite guarded. Uh, there is a 20 to 30 percent drop in uh, outcomes as opposed to a non-radiated field. There are various options described, of which uh, the largest numbers described are anastomotic urethroplasty, and then there are still options of using flaps and grafts. It just depends upon the amount of radiation received in the tissue and uh, what the patient's um, um, uh, thoughts are on uh, salvage procedures and continence. Going to more female urethral strictures um, and saying that they are quite uncommon, but when they do happen, um, they keep having dilatations and not referred for urethroplasty. I think a single dilatation is okay, but beyond that, they should be sent over for urethroplasty with uh, various approaches, which are uh, outlined in the, in the presentation. Then you have also the transgender, which is beyond the scope of this uh, guideline, and that's a whole different topic. What are the other special populations? Patients who got neurogenic bladder, chronic renal failure. Um, in those patients, uh, such as neurogenic bladder, yes, we in the past did not offer them uh, definitive urethroplasty, but that can be done with good results. In uh, renal failure patients, best done before a transplant is put in. Um, in post-transplant uh, strictures, yes, urethroplasty is still an option, even though they are maybe on a slightly higher risk of uh, post-treatment infection. As far as stents are concerned, um, we we used a lot of them in the in in the past, but nowadays we're taking more out than putting them in. So I don't think that's a recommended first line option. Graphs, uh, buckle graphs, I think the mainstay, but you can use various other graphs depending upon the pathology. As lichen sclerosis is the commonest um, uh, one of the commonest etiologies, uh, staying away from uh, skin grafts would be a good option. Finally, uh, the perioperative care, um, most of us would leave catheters in for about three to four weeks, uh, depending upon your institute and your, and your, prior, and your practice. Um, you might wanna take them out earlier with a urethrogram or leave them in uh, without a urethrogram. Patients who've got a good flow rate, there's really no need to intervene or have a look, but yes, you can do a cystoscopy and make sure that your repair is working. So, this is a summary of the entire guidelines and more of this will come in the subsequent talks. All we all hope to is provide a great stream for our patients and uh, thank you for inviting me for the talk. Devang, thank you for speaking uh, on the guidelines. The full guidelines are also available on the website and uh, I'm sure uh, we have just recently celebrated your 100 urethroplasties which you did in Australia. So congratulations for that. Uh, what we are going to do is uh, we are going to invite Professor Keith for his talk because we have kept him awake beyond midnight in Canada. Very unfair. So, Professor Keith, uh, can you just present uh, your views and experience uh, about a dorsal only urethroplasty? All right, thank you. This is a really an honor. It's a real privilege to be part of this diverse and uh, enthusiastic panel of people. I mean, I've, I've crossed paths with so many of you, whether it be Faisal when I was examining the residents with the Royal College in Kuwait City, or whether it be Paxi at the SIU in Melbourne, I remember him because he presented this case of penile paraphenomas that just blew our mind. He reported this case series, but I think it was about like 30 or something ridiculous. I remember that was my introduction to Paxi. And then of course, Stella at the University College London Hospital courses, and then Pankaj and Sanjay, of course, at what seems to be about a million SIUs, AUAs and uh, GERS meetings. But and then Accio, I'm hoping to get to know better when I'm going to Japan, hopefully in December. So um, this is gonna, it's a great group of people. I'm hoping to get to know the rest better as well as we get through our careers. But it's my privilege today to talk about uh, dorsal only urethroplasty for bulbar stricture, mostly to review some of the technical considerations, but also some of the anatomic considerations. My goal is to go through sort of a typical case of mid bulbar strictures. This, that's sort of where the domain and most common strictures tend to present in the bulbar urethra. Um, go through the surgical technique in, in some form or another. Uh, talk about some of the surgical principles of graph tape, because I think we have a duty when we're evolving our specialty to talk about principles and adhere to good surgical principles. Um, talk about the advantages of dorsal onlay, the disadvantages of dorsal onlay, and then sort of some of the evidence surrounding all of this that we do. Uh, almost on a daily basis. So here's what I would consider the typical case. So this is a about a four centimeter 
sort of mid ball bar structures, not too proximal, it's not too distal. Um, I think DVIU, we know most mostly won't have a great effect here. You know, it's long-term data for at least longer strictures is relatively poor. Um, it's not really a candidate for anastomotic urethroplasty. I'm sure Alan Moray would accept that challenge and then resect a four centimeter segment and graph those two ends or anastomose those two ends together. But I don't think I would. I mean, I think core D, penile appearance, all those other things come into play, the patient reported side of what we do. So in this case, it's not so bad. You know, most of the time you just make a midline perineal incision. You would dissect through that subcutaneous fat and call these fascia. You would place some form of retractor in doing so, mobilize Buck's fascia on the left and on either side of the urethra. And of course, once you do that, you can then continue to mobilize if you want or if you choose uh, the perineal body and some of the proximal bubble spongiosis muscle attachments. And that'll give you a fair degree of mobility. And then what, of course, what you're gonna do eventually, once you've done that is incise dorsally, right? Enter that dorsal plane between box and the corpus spongiosum. And once you've done that, you can probably continue your dissection dorsally through that triangular ligament. And in doing so, you've mobilized a fair bit of urethra. Easily now you can place a graft with no fuss or muss. And then if you're doing your dorsal on it, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you've, you've mobilized your urethra already. So the ball bear urethra is mobilized from the corporal bodies. Do a dorsal onlay after, or a dorsal incision after rotating the urethra 180 degrees, spatulate into normal tissue, at least 28 French, both distally and proximally. Spread fix, quilt your buccal mucosal graft dorsally against the corporal bodies and edge of the bubble spongiosis muscle. And then once you're done, you just simply anastomose your urethra dorsally onto this, right? It's nice, it's clean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but some of the considerations I think are important when we're, when we're thinking about graft take. Our plastic surgeon colleagues who've been using grafts before you know, any of us even thought of using this in the urethra, talk about having a healthy graft bed, right? A good graft metabolism. I don't think we can control that, but things we can control are number two principle, graft immobilization and spread fixation. Um, making sure you have great hemostasis and avoiding some of a hematoma. And prevention of infection, I think, is part and parcel of all that, but using the appropriate antimicrobials. And when it comes to the dorsal onlay, the advantages really speak to the principles of good surgery, particularly when you're using a graft, right? Spread fixation and quilting of the graft, number one. That's a huge advantage of the dorsal onlay. Preserving the urethral vascularity. We know non-transecting approaches may preserve sexual function. We had a multi-centered series looking at that. And, you know, but ventral onlay tends to involve a little bit more vasculature. Really good exposure, I found with the dorsal onlay. And there's a certain degree of anatomic versatility mid bulbar, proximal bulbar, distal bulbar, all the way up to the meatus, dorsal only does it all. It's the, it's the workhorse of the um, urethral reconstructive world. So when you talk about spread fixation, that's one of the key principles here. You can see with the dorsal onlay to your left that you can place the graft, you can quilt it easily, you can spread fix it against the graft bed nicely. I'm not picking on Hunter, but you look at the typical ventral onlay series that, you know, the, you're, not, you're not spread fixing the graft. I always feel it's a bit magical when a, when a ventral onlay uh, works because you have the graft, you're not spread fixing it. You know, it's left to sit and there's folds. So I find the dorsal onlay at least aesthetically gives you that spread fixation that the plastic surgeons are always preaching. When you look at the luminal anatomy, and I know Devang has already had a slide on this, but this is classic, right? When you're in the urethra, you gotta think, where are you in the urethra? And in particular, when you're in the ball bar urethra, the lumen is not in the center, it's eccentric, it's dorsal. So the lumen of the urethra is dorsal in the ball bar urethra. And I don't know why we've been doing DVIUs at 12 o'clock for years. That's probably the worst place to do. It should be three and nine, if anything. But when you're doing a urethroplasty, A is where you'd be in the ball bar urethra. A dorsal onlay is going to incise the urethra dorsally, the closest part to the lumen. Ventral onlay, well, what you'll do is you'll be dissecting through all this vascular tissue then to get to the lumen. So, and I think when you talk about vascular preservation and non-transection, well, I think a dorsal onlay is the next step in that, of course, because you're minimally disrupting the vascularity of the urethra. 
Likewise, that preserved vascularity, I think, gives you good exposure. This is a non, this is an augmented anastomotic repair using a buccal graft dorsally. This is a, a augmented anastomotic repair using a buccal mucosal graft ventrally. I mean, there's no sponge in this wound mopping up the blood. <laughs> and eventually, only, inevitably, there is a graft. And there is a sponge placed, sort of, and that vascularity is in the, you're working through that throughout the entire case. Again, dorsal onlay, the exposure is great. I mean, you're just staring as the lumen goes north, deeper it gets, the dorsal onlay follows that. And so this is your proximal anastomosis on a dorsal onlay. The mucosa and the graft are one. And so ventral onlay, a little bit tougher exposure, particularly when you get to the dorsal or the proximal aspects of the bulb. So schematically, a dorsal onlay gives you that spread fixation, that dorsal buttress, so pres preservation of vascularity, and maybe reduces circulation in the long run, maybe helps with a better result. But, you know, the nice thing about it is if your stricture is more distal than you thought, like in this case, you can just keep going. As Sanjay's demonstrated nicely, you can repair the entire urethra through a perineal incision, essentially. Um, so distal bulb, no problem, fixable. Proximal bulb, no issue. As the urethra gets more proximal in the bulb, it goes more dorsal. So as you place a graft more dorsal, you can just keep developing it. It's, you, can, you can rise to it. Eventually, a little bit more challenging because you, you almost have to stand on your, stand on your head. <laughs> so the disadvantage of a dorsal only, it does take longer. I think most would say that's 100% true. The evidence, well, the evidence you know, tells you what it is. Their buccal mucosal graft most commonly used, but this was a systematic review used as part of the EAU guideline. It's interesting to hear about the Indian guideline because I was on the AUA stricture guideline. I wrote the Canadian guideline and I was a reviewer for the EAU guideline. Now that I didn't know there was an Indian guideline, it would be great to sort of synthesize these and have a guideline of guidelines, which would be fascinating. But different, different countries, different appearances. We used a great approach for ours, which allows you to sort of adjust it to the environment that you're working in, which is fascinating. But Nonetheless, the evidence would suggest there's really not a lot of difference between the ventral and the dorsal onlay. Maybe it's the outcomes we're using. Maybe it's short-term follow-up as well. The foot vote, you know, that expression, I think it's British, is where people vote with their feet, you know. And this is an interesting study that it was turns before I joined them, uh, but 11 surgeons. They started in centers in fellowship that did ventral onlays only. They trained at UCSF and UW and in UT Southwestern. And they looked at their trends in urethroplasty from 2010 to 17. It was interesting because you look at 2010, they had, when they did bulbar urethroplasty using grafts, 55% in 2010 were ventral, 45% um, were essentially, 44.5% um, I should say were dorsal. And you look at 2017, it's, it flipped, you know, ventral was 12%, dorsal was 87. So over that seven year period, they voted with their feet. They decided dorsal onlay was for them. So all but one of those 11 surgeons switched to dorsal onlay, which is fascinating, right? So much so that they tried to do an RCT, ventral versus dorsal with Sean Elliott, and he couldn't even accrue. There was nobody that did ventral onlay anymore. So it's tough. I think it would be nice to do an RCT. I think both are very viable, but at least for me, sort of the facts stack up to, I like the dorsal onlay, you know, that preserves the vascularity, gives you great exposure. And secondarily, um, gives you that, you know, versatility that you need. So those are my 10 minutes. That was, that was really amazing, beautiful photographs and an excellent overview of dorsal only. Uh, I reviewed one of your papers, loved reading it about urethral wait time. What occurred to my brain now is we should have speaker wait time in a Zoom program. It's beyond 12, Keith, and that was a fabulous way. And I thank you for accepting the invitation informally in our fellowship meeting. Thank you, Keith. Um, That's right. You know what's funny? I hate to, if I can take one second. Tonight, when I'm sitting in my backyard, it was with our current fellow who's finishing up, our past fellow, Nathan Hoy, who was the author on that paper, and then Dave Chapman, who was one of the other ones, our residents. And as they were about to leave, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be hilarious if I had all three of them like in the background <laughs> in my house? I was gonna like get a bottle of champagne and I was gonna, we're all gonna do it together. But I thought I probably won't be as professional as if I just did it myself. But <laughs> so thanks for inviting me. Next meeting we invite Nathan and everyone. 
<laughs> yeah, that'll be great. They were here anyway. It would have been hilarious. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. Thanks a lot uh, for joining us. Uh, may I request Dr. Arun Chawla uh, to have his presentation on the ventral approach for urethroplasty? Professor Chawla? Yeah. I, I've, we have already introduced you in the beginning of the program. I'm sure you are in the ISU meeting. So I would request you to please take forward your talk, Professor Chawla. Sir, you are muted. We would like yeah. to hear. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, so several uh, surgical techniques have been described for the treatment of uh, bulbar uterus strictures, but the main aim is to have best outcomes with fewer complications. And I'll be talking about uh, ventral only graft urethroplasty. And I, I thank uh, Dr. Pankaj, Dr. Nitesh, and Alto for giving me the opportunity to be part of this program. I'll spend a few minutes uh, in talking about the relevant anatomical details, especially in relation to the location of bulbar uterus strictures, a quick representation of ventral only technique, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of this technique, and the outcomes. It's very <clears throat> important to understand that part of urethra from the penis portal junction to the membranous urethra is actually the bulbar urethra, and not the only urethra which is enclosed in the envelopes of bulbous conjunctus muscle. The bulbar urethra can be conveniently <clears throat> divided into distal two-third, that is from the penis portal junction to the distal margin of bulbous spongiosus muscle and the proximal two-third, which is within the uh, confines of bulbous spongiosus muscle. Corpus spongiosum increases in thickness as it moves proximally from distal to the membranous urethra. And corpus spongiosum to state is a vascular and neuronal structures that surround the urethra. Ventrally, the urethra is placed, uh, uh, distally the urethra is placed in the center, but as we go proximally, the urethra is placed dorsally, that is towards 12 o'clock. Much more significant is the anatomy of the proximal bulb. If you see the picture on the left side, you can see the bulbar urethra in most proximal portion becomes horizontal. And there is abundant of sponge which is placed beyond that urethra that extends beyond the vertical limit of the urethra. This needs to be spared when we plan ventral approach to the proximal bulbar urethra. Any inadvertent incision into this part of ventral sponge can cause oozing and bleeding uh, from this area. Similarly, you can appreciate on the picture on the right side that proximal bulb when mobilized sufficiently to gain access into the uh, dorsal part that is 12 o'clock, is in very close relation to the cavernous nerves. The dotted lines on both the pictures shows the thick ventral sponge beyond the urethra. The key steps of this technique involves midline perineal incision, the incision of the bulbous spongiosus muscle, the ventral urethrotomy. It is very important to note the thickness of the sponge before giving urethrotomy. The sponge should be at least 1.5 centimeters so as to give a good cover to the graft. Any condition which leads to uh, uh, the spongiosal deficiency, this technique is not suitable. Then is the opening and assessment of the urethral strictures. The graft is harvested depending upon uh, the area, donor area, is uh, the cheek, the tongue, the propitious skin, and the penile skin. The length and the width of the graft is tailored to give a new urethra in the bulb of caliber of 26 to 30 French. And this graft is sutured to the mucosa with this second layer of corpus spongiosum and, if possible, third layer. I'll be showing the technique of a ventral onlet technique. Uh, Uthoscopy showing a, a nearly obliterative structure in the mid and proximal bulb. Distillation of methane view, the catheter to see the distal limit of the structure, midline incision, the dissection of the polyspecia. You can see this distal third of the bulb, which is devoid of bulbous spongiosus muscle. The region and separation of the bulbous spongiosus muscle. The catheter to see the distal limit of structure. You thought me at six o'clock or the ventral you thought me. The edges of the urethra taken by the state. Incremental incision in the you thought me to go into the normal urethra, both distally as well as proximally. Taste which was taken to provide a good exposure to the urethra. 
the inside of the urethra. This helps also in curing the hemostasis. A 30 French bougie to see the limit, you can appreciate the proximal urethra, which is seen clearly. And when the stick is very proximal, you have to do the intra urethral incision, intra urethral placement. The suitable size graft has to cover the urethra. Usually, a nasal scapulum, the tip of the aster tube, and the debacus can easily go if the urethotomy is into the normal urethra. This proximal suture at 6 o'clock is very important. Two more sutures on the side is taken. The graft taken is again parachuted and three interpreted sutures are tied to it. The closure is started on the one side. Here you can see the left side being closed, mucosa to mucosa, with a little bit of sponges. Here should be taken to provide a watertight closure. The catheter is placed. This slides in easily once the euthotomy is adequate into the normal margin. The extra graft is primed. Similar closure of the urethra with the corpus spongiosum. Mucosa to mucosa on one side, completed on the other side also. It's very important if you are taking skin, the, the suturing should be very meticulous, not to have the eversion of the skin edges. The corpus spongiosum cover over the graft. Here is important to take a little bit of the graft when you are suturing the corpus spongiosum over this ventral place graft. This provides the fixation of the graft to the corpus spongiosum. After the closure of this layer, if the sponge is healthy and is robust, you can provide in a third layer of closure over this. Uh, when we talk about ventral only, it is ironical, you have to compare it with the, the dorsal only technique. We know that uh, the bleeding is more from the robust sponge, which is placed ventrally in the proximal urethra. But what is the more important to understand when the graft is placed ventrally, it is semicircular in position. Uh, as it lies within the convexity of this urethra, but it is flat when it is lying under the on the dorsal technique when it is fixed to the undersurface of corporal bodies. The sponge covers a full circumference of the graft in ventral only technique, while it covers only ventral half circumference of the urethra in the dorsal only. The rest of the half is covered by the urethra, which is fixed to the corporal bodies. The urethra takes a circular shape in ventral only technique, while it is just a flat host type in dorsal only technique. Uh, there are different advantages of this technique. It's, uh, it's a very uh, uh, easy technique to follow with involves minimum of dissection. Once you incise the bulbous sponges, you are right over the urethra. You can uh, open the urethra and inspect the whole of the limits of the urethral structure. Uh, the blood supply in the ventral sponge is abundant and this provides a good vascular bed to the graft. The exposure is very easy and you can uh, it's very easy to inspect the proximal urethra, especially the proximal urethra bul bulbar structures. And um, you don't lift the uh, this bulb or you don't mobilize this bulb, so the microvasculature on the undersurface of this uh, proximal urethra is always preserved because uh, the sponge is very thick in the uh, middle third and the uh, proximal third, so it's more of oozing and bleeding from this part of urethra. And other thing is, unlike dorsal urethra, where the graft is fixed to the is solid base, the, the ventrum uh, doesn't, the ventral sponge doesn't provide that type of uh, structural support to the graft, though, though it provides a good vascularity. Uh, coming to the success rates, uh, the is systemic review uh, uh, from Christopher Chappell and his group and a, a large uh, series of uh, 1,242 uh, patients uh, uh, from uh, Guido Barbagli has reported a success rate of 
average success rate of around 88%. Uh, and the, these results have been uniformly reported in other literature series also. Uh, this is, these results are comparable to the dorsal only technique. Uh, coming to the functional outcomes, um, it is uh, well proved in uh, 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 different uh, uh, publications that uh, the erectile function improves after the ventral only uh, euthoplasty. Uh, but uh, in one of the uh, randomized uh, uh, study between the barbospongiosis muscle sparing and non-sparing, it has been found there's a uh, less incidence of ejaculatory dysfunction uh, uh, when the uh, bulbous sponges muscle is spared and ventral only being a, a technique where we go into the bulbous sponges is probably theoretically more incidence of ejaculatory dysfunction. However, this has not been uniformly reported in other series. Very interesting um, uh, publication has come from the TURNS group, which is a the trauma urethral reconstructive uh, uh, network surgeons group. Uh, what they reported is that uh, ejaculatory dysfunction, the post void dribble, uh, has a common etiology. And what they found in their um, retrospective series is that uh, the ejaculatory dysfunction is the same in the penile euthoplasty as well as the bulbar euthoplasty. And as well as the post wide dribble is almost uh, similar in the penile euthoplasty and the bulbar euthoplasty. Uh, this high rates of ejaculatory dysfunction um, can argue against the theory of bulbar spongiosis muscle being the uh, cause of uh, post void dribble and the uh, uh, ejaculatory dysfunction. Uh, study did not report uh, 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 differentiate between the dorsal and the ventral technique. Uh, however, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, suggested that it needs, uh, probably it may be because of central in the region, and it has nothing to do with the bulbous spongiosis muscle dissection. Uh, and this probably is not related to the graft circulation also. So which condition this ventral only technique can be made is the basically the structure which are located in the mid dorsal and the proximal urethra where the uh, ventrum uh, is uh, uh, having a thick and uh, robust sponge. Uh, usually it is the urethra which is uh, uh, enclosed within the bulbous spongiosus muscle. Uh, the failures after the post dorsal only urethroplasty, the obese and the young patients uh, where the uh, uh, Erectile function is important because when we go for the dorsal in the proximal urethra, you encounter the cavernous nerves. A very proximal post TRP stru structure are best suited for this technique, as well as the tight obliterative structure and the radiation structures. Um, another versatility of this uh, uh, venter technique is you can you can modify your technique uh, instead of putting you can just uh, uh, put a graft on the under surface of. Uh, uh, the carpal bodies, and this can this can become as a dorsal inlet technique or a sofa technique. Uh, similarly, uh, you can uh, in the in the tight obliterative structures, uh, you can place uh, one graft as a dorsal inlay and another graft as a ventral onlay. So this becomes a double face uh, dorsal inlay and ventral onlay technique as uh, promoted by uh, Pirovic and Palmentary. And another advantage of this is you can always do a augmented anastomotic or augmented non-transacting -trans anastomosis in this ventral approach. Here you can see the, the scar on a tight obliterated scar on the dorsum is being excised and the ventral thotomy is being uh, replaced, being covered by the, the skin. And this technique can always uh, terminate as a perineal thotomy in case of adverse local conditions. To conclude, uh, uh, it is a very easy technique to uh, do and you don't need uh, uh, a very uh, large series of experience uh, and even uh, the younger surgeon can take this technique. It is quicker to do and, and it's, it's, uh, it provides a very quick exposure to the proximal urethra as well. It's the least invasive because uh, uh, you just go into the urethra and size it and uh, you can uh, inspect the whole confine of the urethra structures and modify your technique. It's a very versatile, very versatile as uh, I, I told that you can have a dorsal inlay, you can have a augmented anastomotic or uh, augmented non transecting anastomotic, or you can just end up in having a uh, you trust me. The key um, point in, in this technique, uh, the good proximal sutures, uh, which anchor to the graft in the uh, proximal uh, uh, lumen, uh, which provides the excellent success rate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chawla. And as a part of ISU, uh, ISU now you are the professor 
for the entire indian nation so excellent work and i really thanks for joining us uh, may i request uh, professor kulkarni to give his views uh, on all the four talks that we have had and his vast experience uh, about his first of all thank you pankaj and thank you ulto group uh, for inviting me and uh, first talk was by evelyn mashoka from pretoria and it, she gave a very nice overview of the role of dviu in today's um, uh, arena uh, what, what important point i would like to say what keith mentioned is uh, traditionally we have been cutting uh, the urethra in the bulbar portion at 12 o'clock my rich, guru richard tanwari suggested in 1985 that there is uh, plenty of spongy tissue proxim ventrally so he requested uh, dviu to be done between 4 and 8 o'clock and which we have been following for last 30 years this is the um, uh, this is the standard that we follow and now if you see the use of laser which we use thulium or homium laser for a ring structure following uh, anastomotic urethroplasty for posterior urethra we use it again at 6 o'clock so one simple modification you just uh, rotate suppose you have done a dorsal on then the ring formation in the proximal end i don't want to incise the urethra at the dorsal portion where the mucosa has joined the urethra so i will rotate the instrument and cut it between 4 and 8 o'clock uh, another point is about um, dviu followed by self care now what happens is um, uh, there is a paper by richard santucci in 2009 what he suggested is that this um, endo urologists have always exaggerated the success rate of um, dviu from 30 to 70% and he quoted that the actual success rate hovers around 9% long term success rate um, uh, wh what i would say that in our unit we ask the patient to do self care only in three categories one is patient is unfit for surgery patient refuses surgery or after multiple failed urethroplasties i will give a simple example so suppose i have 10 patients with short non traumatic bulbar structure and i ask i do a dviu and ask them to do self care so these are two different treatments dviu and self care if you ask 10 patients 10 out of 10 patients to do self care that means in your mind you know the success rate of dviu is 0% suppose the success rate of dvi was 50% you are asking five patients or 50% patients to do self care when it is not indicated you understand so in your mind you know that the success rate of dvi u for a structure um, um, is not as quoted by the people we had um, a very nice talk by uh, dr devang desai about the indian guidelines i will request all of you to go through the guidelines and the guidelines are could be country specific because what are the difficulties in a country and what treatment is available could differ from each country so then we had two nice talks one by um, keith fantastic talk on dorsal only and another good talk by um, arun chawla on ventral only in our unit i always say that when in doubt always open the urethra dorsally and distally because once you make an incision either ventral or dorsally you are committed to perform some kind of surgery so idea is when in doubt open the urethra dorsally distally otherwise you can choose your indications and perform urethroplasty wherever you want to augment the urethra uncle do you want to say anything no amazing and uh, i would just like to add uh, uh, that uh, he was the one who actually popularized the use of a small caliber urethroscope uh, we did write to the european guidelines committee because sometimes your own thoughts get lost but what i realize is that's why we have the youtube live so whatever we are saying is going in the digital record and you will have a youtube citation soon so that was one of the fantastic contributions from you uh, professor kulkarni so so the classification very simple we a normal bulbar urethra is 30 french then uh, if you can pass a flexible cystoscope is about 16 french if you can pass a, a ureteroscope is about 7 french only guide wire goes in is 3 french and there is a complete obliteration so we don't operate on a patient who with 15 french urethra 16 french urethra or a normal urethra so our patients come with a urethra which is less than 10 french as suggested by joe smith in 1966 uh, below the 10 french uh, size of the urethra the patient will develop symptoms of obstruction and then we are dealing with uh, zero french that means obliterative structure near obliterative structure and a narrow urethra so depending upon the size of urethra 
you choose your procedure. Absolutely. Thank you. And when Nitesh invited and he had a word with me and then uh, I, I always am very lucky that I meet the SIU president and my guru every day while you all meet him occasionally. But uh, that's, that's my luck. Uh, and I spoke to him about a debate and he said there is no debate in urethroplasty. It is just that you have to have a proper indication. So yeah. we changed the topic from debate to yeah. when to do and what to do. Yeah. For UAA, I was asked to uh, give a debate upon uh, buccal mucosa graft versus flap uh, skin. I said, there is no debate. Well, the first choice is this, second choice is that. You know, what's the debate here? Dorsal versus ventral? You choose whatever you like, the success rates are almost equal. Thank you, Bangladesh. Thank you, Thank you sir. Yeah. Uh, we take the program forward. May I invite uh, Akio to have his word, uh, have his thoughts about transaction in bulbar structure. And Akio, majority of your manuscripts are reviewed by us. So <laughs> that's the credit. I'm going to remove the pin on the video. So Akio, you can uh, please put your pin on the video, Akio. Thank you, Pankaj, very much. Uh, very kind uh, introduction. Can you see my slide? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, great meeting. Uh, I'm very honored to be here uh, with uh, world famous experts. So today I'm going to talk about a transaction urosoplasty uh, for barbar stricture, which is uh, one of the most fundamental technique of urosoplasty. So first, uh, barba urethra is the most common site of anterior urethral stricture in all age groups. And it accounts for about half of all cases. So we uh, reconstructive urologists are very likely to encounter barba urethra stricture in our daily practice. So this is a, a table of selection of barba urethroplasty. This is my preference. So, the type of urethroplasty depends on the site and length of stricture. And anastomotic urethroplasty, uh, such as transecting urethroplasty, that is excision and primary anastomosis, EPA, and non transecting EPA. These are best suited for short and proximal urethral stricture. And especially, EPA is the main strategy for uh, treatment of uh, dense fibrosis, such as traumatic barber stricture. Uh, this illustrates uh, show the uh, surgical steps of EPA. Uh, EPA is one of the most fundamental technique of urethroplasty, and its surgical concept is very simple. The uh, step include a fully mobilizing barber urethra and complete excision of scar tissue. And finally, a creation of wide and tension-free anastomosis. And this slide show the surgical outcome of EPA for barber stricture from large series from the world. EPA has very excellent long-term outcome of uh, generally over 90%. And in a meta-analysis uh, performed in 2010 SIU-ICUD consultation, overall success rate of EPA was reported to be 93.8% in more than 1,000 patients with very limited complications. So what about assessment of barbar urethral stricture? Uh, this is my preference. So uh, regardless of etiologies, we always perform a retrograde and anti-grade urethrography and stethoscope in all patients. And, we, uh, and in addition, we use MRI for uh, traumatic stricture, uh, such as uh, straddle injury, because urethrography or cystoscopy does not uh, uh, give uh, adequate information about periurethral tissues. Periurethral tissue information is, I think uh, it is important for the urethroplasty for traumatic structure. I show some examples. Uh, these two patients uh, uh, have uh, 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 traumatic barber structures and both patients have the very similar uh, length of structure and similar location of structures. However, uh, on MRI, 
the MRI findings in these patients are quite different. In patient one, the continuity of corpus spongy awesome tissue is uh, maintained. However, it is completely disrupted in patient two. Actually, operating findings are also different. In patient one, the urethroplasty was uh, relatively uh, straightforward because periurethral adhesion was minimal. However, in patient two, uh, very, very strong, strong adhesion was found in patient two and the urethral mobilization was so difficult. This finding suggests MRI could be helpful to predict complexity of repair in traumatic structures. Uh, so uh, this is a representative structure of uh, traumatic structure. And I think this is a relatively uh, straightforward case. So uh, I'm going to show uh, my surgical video for this case. The patient is uh, placed in a high lithotomy position and a midline peroneal incision is made. And bulbo spongy osseous muscle is then uh, divided and retracted laterally to expose barba urethra. The barba urethra is circumferentially mobilized. This step should be done sharply, not bluntly, uh, in order to avoid uh, injury to the corpus spongy osseum. A light angle clamp is passed dorsally to the uh, barba urethra, and a nailton catheter is uh, passed around the urethra. And then barba urethra is mobilized up to the penoscrotal junction distally and down to the uh, triangular ligament proximally. So um, barba urethral mobilization is sometimes very difficult step. In this patient, uh, barbell structure length is so short on urethrography, but on MRI, very dense and wide uh, fibrosis was found. In this case, uh, I expected this uh, mobilization is, is maybe a very difficult. Uh, as I expected, in this case, barbell urethral mobilization was very tough because uh, periurethral adhesion was so strong and the physiological layer around the corpus pongi awesome was already disappeared. Therefore, MRI could be helpful to predict this complexity before urethroplasty. So video is back to the first case. After uh, mobilizing barba urethra, a foley catheter is inserted and the st structure site is identified. Barba urethra is uh, transected proximally to the stricture, and the normal urethral mucosa is identified. The stricture segment is completely excised. And to create a wide anastomosis site, the proximal urethral end is spatulated dorsally, and ventral. Uh, distal urethra is spatulated ventrally. I prefer to place a eight interrupted 4-0 PDS sutured. In the dorsal half of the urethra, I place uh, in, uh, sutures in one layer because a spongy awesome tissue is seen in this side. On the other hand, uh, ventral half, I use two layer sutures because corpus spongy awesome in this side is much thicker. This is the first layer sutured at the six o'clock position. Thereafter, uh, the spondy awesome tunica is closed by 4-0 PDS learning sutures. The anastomosis is completed. So uh, what about uh, complications? EPA is a safe and uh, have uh, low frequency of complications. However, uh, complications that may affect sexual function have also reported, such as a cold feeling in the glands, uh, decreased gland sensitivity, and decreased uh, erectile function. 
And these complications are uh, thought to be attributed to urethral transduction. And this slide shows the comparison of changes in IIEF5 scores uh, over time after EPA and uh, only augmentation. In patients who underwent EPA experience transient decrease, significant decrease at three months after uh, retroplasty. Um, in our series, I also experienced the same trend. Uh, this is uh, our recent series of EPA in 308 patients. Although we experienced a high uh, surgical success rate and achieved very high success uh, patient satisfaction, 90.1% patient experienced transient decreased SIM score greater than five score at six POM. Although this decrease was transient and most patients recovered, I think it is better not to transact the urethra if possible. And this is a, a histological findings of a resected uh, barbar strictures. And compared to the traumatic strictures, uh, the uh, scar area uh, in the idiopathic stricture is very limited. And most spongy awesome tissue was normal. So uh, it is not always necessary to transect urethra in every case. From this point, and in order to achieve both structural removal and preservation of spongy awesome tissue, uh, in, in 2007, Dr. Jordan established vessel sparing EPA technique. And thereafter, uh, Dr. Andrich and Dr. Mandy uh, developed non transducting EPA technique. And this topic will be discussed later by Dr. Ibaz. This is the last slide. And EPA uh, remains the gold standard treatment for barbar stricture with dense fibrosis especially in traumatic etiologies. The keys to success of EPA include adequate urethral mobilization, complete stricture excision, and creation of wide and tension-free anastomosis. Whether or not transect urethra should be determined on the balance of risk and benefit. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Akio, that was a fantastic thing and amazing video, as elegant as your knowledge. It is always fun to interact with you. And uh, I know now you're shifting more towards a non-transacting approach and buckle yes, yes. uh, because I read that in the manuscript. Amazing. And the best way to end a presentation is to invite the next speaker so there is no animosity. So not, no one better than Stella to speak about a non-transacting and a non-transacting urethroplasty in bulbar urethra. Stella, uh, please start your talk. Thank you. Let me try and um, share my um, slides. Can you see the slides? Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, that um, introduction um, ties very well into the non-transacting bulbar urethroplasty approach that I'll be talking about. Um, so just um, the standard approaches to bulbar um, strictures is traditionally excision and end-to-end -end anastomosis. And we just heard about that. And for longer strictures, ventral or dorsal oral mucosal uh, grafts. Here is just a quick summary of the excision and end-to-end -end anastomosis technique that we just heard about. The urethra is mobilized. A stricture is excised and um, we usually spatulate the healthy ends and anastomose them. And then the, um, the Barbagli technique for the longer strictures where again we mobilize the urethra, we uh, harvest a buccal mucosal graft or, uh, or oral mucosal graft um, and then we quilt it onto the uh, tunica albuginea and uh, Dr. Dr. Rook has nicely described this technique. So moving on from that, um, what is potentially um, wrong with such an approach for short bulbar strictures 
is that why transect when there's an organ preserving way of doing the anastomotic repair and the decision to transect based on the urethrogram uh, can sometimes be misleading and there is an element of irreversibility of the transaction should the stricture turn out to be longer and I think we all had situations where we transected and found that um, you know that the, the stricture and the mucosa wasn't healthy for a much longer segment than was apparent on the urethrogram. Also with the uh, buccal graft augmentation uh, donor site mobility with big grafts is a, a problem and post micturition dribbling can be significant with large grafts. So the non transecting bulbar urethroplasty is really an approach it's not a particular procedure and the aim is to treat the stricture preserve the spongiosal vascularity and minimize surgical morbidity. Um, there we'll go through different different techniques and um, some of them are more appropriate at times than other, but we can sort of subdivide them into a simple stricturoplasty or Heineken Mikulich technique, an excision of the stricture and mucosal anastomosis, and sometimes it's necessary to uh, augment the anastomosis and then for longer strictures we do the uh, dorsal stricturotomy and oral mucosal uh, patch that was previously described. So we always use a common approach uh, to these urethroplasties. We make a midline perineal incision. We mobilize the urethra, uh, expose it and make a dorsal stricturotomy uh, and make sure that we are into healthy tissue each side. And we really then inspect um, and look at the mucosa and feel and see what's going on. And in such a way, we, we choose what the appropriate next step would be. I think it's a really versatile uh, approach to do this and it gives us many options which sometimes we don't have when we transect. So um, we are very much um, in favor of the dorsal stricturotomy approach. Uh, so here we can see a demonstration of the uh, non-transecting mucosal anastomosis. So after the dorsal stricturotomy is made into healthy ends to assess the stricture length, the, there's an excision of spongia fibrosis from within the lumen, preserving healthy ventral spongiosum and the bulbar arteries. And then the mucosal anastomosis is made within the lumen. And if possible, we try and close it with a horizontal uh, closure uh, of the dorsal stricturotomy. So we open it vertically and try and close it horizontally if possible. Uh, here's again a diagrammatic uh, representation. This is purely a stricturoplasty, which is not always possible. This is um, basically just opening uh, the uh, urethra dorsally and uh, very occasionally it's possible to just close it horizontally uh, as per Heineken Mikulich. This is appropriate for uh, very small and uh, not very tight strictures. Uh, this um, demonstrates the non-transecting excision and mucosal anastomosis. So you can see here um, the urethra exposed dorsally and this purple patch um, is the scarred area which is excised and then um, the mucosa is um, anastomosed to healthy mucosa um, and then the urethra is closed. Occasionally, um, the, the segment of fibrosis is longer and it's not possible to close the mucosa directly to the mucosa and we sometimes have to put a small patch of oral mucosal graft within the lumen and quilt it on uh, before the urethra is closed. And then again for the longer stretches We've talked about uh, this in a previous talk, um, the classic Barbagli technique, uh, which is um, always uh, appropriate for uh, the longer bulbous strictures. So I'd like to stress that the non-transecting approach is not for traumatic strictures. If you have a um, fall astride injury, this is not the technique and an excision and end-to-end -end anastomosis is the standard of, of care. So there's no point in even thinking of this approach for traumatic strictures. 
this is a little bit about the outcomes uh, and also uh, the numbers um, that uh, uh, of the cases that we have. You can see that the non-transecting mucosal anastomosis uh, is um, probably the most common uh, within this technique, and uh, we had uh, 90 in, in this series. Then the non-transecting aug augmented anastomotic urethroplasty is uh, the second highest number, and the structuroplasty, uh, where the, um, there's literally just a Heineken Mikulic uh, closure horizontally, is only rarely possible. But uh, in terms of stricture recurrence, uh, this was only 4%, which compares very favorably to excision and primary anastomosis, where the restricture rate was 9%, and the traditional dorsal patch urethroplasty, where the restricture rate was about 7%. And we think that this might be because we are preserving the blood supply. In terms of the functional outcome, uh, again, the, there's uh, a favorable outcome. Uh, post micturition dribbling seems to be less with this type of uh, urethroplasty. And we know that large dorsal patches can have a significant post micturition dribbling effect in patients. And also, new erectile dysfunction uh, was favorable compared to the other techniques. So, uh, just to summarize, the non transecting approach to bulbar urethroplasty for idiopathic strictures gives the freedom to choose the best technique for each patient according to the nature of the stricture and the surgeon's skill and experience and to minimize surgical trauma. And the only routine indication for transecting the bulbar urethroplasty in our practice nowadays is really for traumatic strictures. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity uh, to share um, this talk. And um, yes, uh, I'll just hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Stella, thank you for an, such an elegant talk so early in the morning, London time 5 a.m., so excellent. I um, <laughs> invite, uh, invite uh, Professor Kulkarni to have his views on the talks. Yeah, started. I enjoyed the talk by Akio and by, by Stella. Uh, I just want to divide my career into three eras. I started practicing in after uh, getting training in England with Richard Tanwarik. I came back to Pune in 87. So 87 to 96 till, till the introduction of dorsal and ventral only buccal mucosa. We were using a lot of transaction urethroplasty for bulbar. We were doing a lot of two-stage urethroplasties like Johansson, and we were using a lot of flaps. So that's period number one. After 96, uh, when I met um, Guido Barbagli in a master class, which was arranged by Professor Mundy in London in 1997, we started doing dorsal only and little bit of ventral only at that time, but majority dorsal only is from 96 to 2010. That's the second period in my life. Now, third period is what, when, the, when Professor Mundy and Daniela introduced this uh, non-transaction bulbar orthoplasty. Initially, we were a little hesitant to start, but now if I talk to Pankaj, in our unit, the most common urethroplasty that we perform for bulbar urethroplasty is a non-transaction bulbar urethroplasty. So this is a transition from one to another, like most were transacted before, we transect now only for trauma. And most of the time we like to do dorsal only buccal mucosa. And we would like to take care of the urethral plate by different techniques, which uh, Stella suggested. And we, um, we have specific indications for ventral only, one, two, three, obese patient, post URP, and a young sexual active male. Otherwise, we would like to use the non-transaction bulbar urethroplasty in majority patient unless the uh, plate is really wide and we don't get those patients where the urethral plate is very wide. Usually there is a short stricture, so we do mucosal anastomosis, we do double face, and we are very thankful to the UCLA team for introducing this new technique and changing our life. I would like to publish a paper pre and post um, this uh, NTBU, you know, whether our success rate has changed or not. You understand that could be interesting um, paper that we can follow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Thank you, Professor. Uh, may I invite uh, Faisal Alajri uh, for his talk on two states? So regarding Faisal, uh, it, was, it was amazing because he has done a lot of work for the war, war crime victims, especially in the Middle East and Syria, and very few of us would have the guts to go and travel. So uh, we call him King. So King Faisal, please uh, have your talk, and we are very happy to have you in this program.
Thank you, Bankash, and thank you, uh, Sanjay. It's a great honor to be involved in this uh, great gathering. And I hope that I will give a nice view about stage erythroblasty. So today, as you know, that today we, in Kuwait here, we are working day, not like you, all are relaxed. So I'm in theater now. So I would like, I would like to shoot with my lecture. So how can we screen? open your presentation and then just yeah perfect yes so <clears throat> so well as you know stage erythroblasty is the oldest form of urethral reconstruction this picture uh, it's for uh, sir robert hamilton russell uh, who the first described the stage erythroblasty in literature 1914. Although it took time for me to find this picture more than to preparing this uh, presentation. This technique was refined and popularized by Johansson in 1953 and later modified by other surgeons such as Tanner Warwick, uh, Mundy, Schreiter. <laughs> Technically speaking, all proposed stage urethroblasty surgery have in common the concept of exposing the disease urethra through an open urethrotomy incision, then either marsupialization or excising the diseased urethra. As you can see here, one of the most popular stage urethroblasty procedure is the mesh graft urethroblasty as described by Schreiter. This operation particularly useful for complex structure. So traditionally believed that stage urethroblasty is the proper technique for all penile structures. However, Asoba as well currently described two different techniques for treating a primary penile urethra structure. On the left side, of my presentation. This is the uh, in, dorsal inlay procedure used by Asoba as single stage. And on the right side, the Kulkarni technique. So the use of either technique is based on urethral plate as the cut off as Kulkarni proposed in one of his literatures, uh, the, the width of eight millimeter and as if you have more than eight millimeters, so Asoba will be the proper technique and less than eight millimeter, so Kulkarni technique will be the best technique. So one of the nice article that I have read is the one uh, written by Kulkarni about the, the management of anterior urethra. So he proposed that stage urethroplasty is suitable for patients with either failed hypospedus, repair, prior failed erythroblasty, and no practicable urethral blade. So, stage, a stage buckle graft erythroblasty, as described by Praka, gained a huge popularity. The technique involved excision, excision of the urethral scar tissue, with insertion of buckle graft at first stage, and six months later, he will tubularize the urethra. <clears throat> the skin graft stage urethroblasty was set with long-term success rate of approximately 50%. With the introduction of mucosa graft, the over overall success rate was improved to be 80%. However, Snodgrass, Mukhlis, or Bagley all reported that the buccal mucosa graft contraction rate between 12 to 30%, which mandate to a redo grafting, which may delay the, sec the second stage procedure as it can be achieved in th third or fourth 
uh, four, four stages. This also seen in another study by Cousin, who found that patient under which underwent stage erythroblasty, 18.7% required revision of their first stage. This because of contraction of the urethral blade or buccal mucosa graft, and 7.7% required revision of their second stage. Again, Mori found that a seven, a, after he published his technique on 78 patients underwent multi-stage reconstruction with an overall complication rate of 19.2% and a revision rate of 10.3 with higher incidence of complication of urethral, erythrocutaneous fistula as well other complication. So now, traditionally, we talk about that you will insert the buccal mucosa at the first stage, and on the second stage, after six months, you will do temporalization. However, this those temperature here, this is a reading of my city, Kuwait city, Jeddah and Dubai, the area, the Middle East. And as you can see in the middle, the Kuwait city, noon time and evening time, there is no different in temperature. We have high temperature and high humidity as in Jeddah and Dubai. So Professor Mandi have noticed that the rate of contracture was different in cases he did it in UK when he compared to Saudi Arabia with 4% of contraction rate in UK to 33% contraction rate in Saudi Arabia. The author comment that the graft contraction may, or the higher rate of contract, uh, contra graft contraction may related to climate change. As you see, our countries, it's the hell. So if we say that we are in hell, means Kuwait and the surrounding. For that purpose, and for that reason, we changed our practice to the technique described by Kulkarni in 2015. This technique described that in the first stage, you will perform a Johansson stage without using a buccal mucosa. You will remove all uh, scar tissue, all disease tissue, and keep it for a while, three to, to six months. And, and on the next stage, you will apply the buccal mucosa and do temporalization. Since 2015, we are using this technique and we are satisfied here in Kuwait with our results. And I hope soon we will publish this results. Here, a novel, here an article written by Dushi, who found that the success rate after using the modified, the modified procedure up to 89.5%. The author suggested that this technique is suitable for those with multiple failure, failed surgeries with very narrow urethral human, less than nine French, with or without fistula. Another study came from India, okay, combining the single stage to stage, and they found that there is no significant difference between the success rate of each procedure. In conclusion, a stage urethroblasty is often necessary to manage difficult anterior structure that involve the venile urethra. However, multi-stage or stage urethroblasty should replace the two-stage urethroblasty as the accepted terminology, as it's not 
uncommon for patient to require more than two procedures to complete his success, successful temporalization. At the end, I would like to thank you for this great invitation, and I hope I gave a nice overview of stage erythroblasty. Thank you. Faisal, thank you. That was a very excellent talk on uh, how to manage, and uh, we like your terminology that you have suggested, multi-stage erythroplasty. Yeah. Yeah, this, is, this is the picture from Kuwait. It's at night time, okay? But this is was taken in winter, not in summer. As Kulkani, he, Kulkani was in Kuwait and he knows the weather, I invited him in the, the, the proper time in Kuwait. Yeah. He remembered that twice. Yes, yes. Thank you. I, I, cannot, I cannot invite you in summer here in Kuwait or even, even Kethro, he didn't come to, to, to us in summer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May I invite our rock star Paxi to speak on a single stage erythroplasty? Paxi, please. Uh, Faisal, I'm going to just, uh, yeah, I'm going to stop your scare sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. Go run and do your erythroplasty. Thank you. See you. Bye bye. So, Pankaj, may I start my presentation? Yes, please, Paxi. It's all over you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Pankaj, my very good friend. Uh, my also thank you to uh, our guru, Professor Kulkarni, who has given me the the chance to to share our experience in Indonesia. And this time, this is basically not a debate because we are basically agree on on the on the topics whether it's one stage or stage uh, repair in uh, penile with a stricture. I just want to introduce myself. I come from Malang, the second largest city in East Java province in Indonesia. This is a touristic uh, destination, actually. Uh, Dr. Joshi and Professor Kukarni has already come to our city. It's very nice. And also, this is a very nice place to ride around the, 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 the city. Um, this is my new hobby during the pandemic, uh, cycling around our city. And I would like to also thank you, uh, Professor Kukarni, because Everything I knew about uh, urethral reconstructive surgery based on his uh, teaching um, around nine years ago, 10 years ago. And this is when he went to Bali. We have our Isoru meeting, life surgery workshop is unforgettable. And I hope we could do this again in the future. And this is our last uh, dinner in Bali, in Jimbaran. Stella is also there, Professor Mandi, uh, Professor Kukarni and Madam, and also uh, Jay. So, as Dr. Faisal has already presented, what about stage erythroplasty? This is actually um, uh, popularized by Professor Johansson when he opened the urethra uh, wide, and then uh, at the second stage, he tubularized. And then another technique from Professor Schreiter from Germany, he put a split thickness a skin graft to enlarge the urethral plate. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, and... Uh, Another uh, technique was introduced by Braca. I'm sorry, I put this uh, a picture in this slide. But if you look at the, these techniques, in, in the Braca techniques, 39% uh, of the patients require, require a new surgical revision of the grafted, era, uh, grafted area. And also, if you think about stage plasticity, please remember this. I don't think anyone in, this, in the audience who wants to have his, uh, his urethra or his penis looks like this. So basically, this is a last resort surgery. I don't think anyone wants to have his uh, urethra open like this. So if you look at the, the history of penile urethroplasty, initially there are so many uh, flaps techniques. There are Orendi flaps and then Q-flap fissure cutaneous. And if you look at in, uh, in 1968, uh, Professor Ahmad Orendi introduced a local skin flap to fix the penile uh, skin, uh, uh, penile stricture with a penile skin. The, uh, the success rate was reasonable at that time. And then a uh, corti flap uh, also introduced using a facial cutaneous. And also, again, Professor Jack W. McKenich introduced the facial cutaneous circular flap. This is uh, in the old days, as like Professor Kulkarni so, uh, mentioned before. And another in 2000, the Q-flap reconstruction of pendulum stricture was introduced in the late uh, 90s or in the 2000s. And the problem is, um, if we compare flaps and graft, the flaps have basically more uh, complication. 
It creates a uh, more penile hematoma, skin necrosis, fistula, also torsion, circulation, or also metastenosis. So the evolution of urethroplasty, as Professor Kolkani has mentioned before, the evolution from flaps, it, uh, it shifted to the graft. The two-stage repair shifted to one-stage repair with a minimal invasive technique. It doesn't meet with endourology, but the muscle, a nerve, and a vascular sparing surgery. So these are four fundamental uh, uh, techniques in one-stage repair, augmentation with plasty. In 1996, Professor Barbagli introduced the dorsal only uh, bocomacoso graph. Uh, Professor Jack W. McKenich and Al Morey introduced also ventral only in 96. Um, and then dorsal only asopa, dorsal inlay asopa was introduced in 2001. And the one side that's actually this uh, phenomenal and fundamental techniques was introduced in 2009. This is the classic barbecue technique with the dorsal, pat, dorsal patch, abacomacoso dura, and then uh, anastomos, the lateral lateral side. And then um, I'm very fortunate to meet Professor Asapa a few years ago in Hyderabad. And this is the dorsal inlay technique that was introduced by him. And this is the most important techniques even in my practice today. The one side dissection, a dorsal only bacomacoso dura, uh, Professor Pokarni and Dr. Joshi has already uh, reported the long-term outcome with a more than 85% success rate. And how to do that? Um, I'm doing a two-team approach for buccal mucosal growth to the I'm, tra I'm training my colleagues, residents, and nurses to have more effective work. So it is two-team approach. One team take a very long buccal mucosal graph, and I could do a perennial approach. This is the basic uh, principle of doing a one-side dissection Bocomocosal graft when you had a, a lichen sclerosis um, and uh, we inject the methylene blue and then midline perineal incision. The only muscle that we uh, excise is only the barbell coprenosal to reduce or minimize the risk of uh, erect, uh, ejaculation disorder. And then we invaginate the penis so the whole urethra is in one unit. And then we uh, dissect the spongiosa so over the midline. So we could expose the whole urethra uh, from a pin out to bobber. Then the, one of the most important step of the procedure is doing a proper meatotomy, urethral incision in 12 o'clock, and then put the uh, buccal mucosal graft in dorsal aspect. Um, it, nowadays, my residents could uh, harvest uh, six to nine centimeters of buccal mucosal graft, depends on uh, however I need. The second choice of my practice is the lingual. And then after that, we put the book of mucosal graft in the dorsal aspect. It has to be a very wide and then uh, quilt the mucosa. This is the trick that I learned from Professor Kukarni and Dr. Joshi is diagonal anastomosis in the mucosal to mucosal anastomosis. And then we do a three line quilting. The first anastomosis is graft capernosa and mucosal anastomosis. And the second one is a graft caponosa and spongiosa uh, anastomosis. We put a silicon catheter for around four or maximum six weeks. So basically for anterior urethra structure, this is our algorithm in Indonesia that was adopted from uh, Professor Kulkarni's teaching and also similar to the Indian uh, Urological Association guidelines. We divide the penile structure to simple and complex. We only do two-stage repair in the complex uh, structures where you do not have a practical uh, urethral plate. But in the relatively simple uh, structures, we could do a one-stage repair with a buccal mucosa graft with different types of uh, techniques. These are our data. So if I, want, if I could share my experience after uh, two or three years of our uh, urethroplasty experience, actually the stage urethroplasty only accounted for 5% of my practice. Others are um, uh, one stage repair. The most techniques that I use is one side dissection dorsal only bocomacosal graft. What about the complex penile structure? There are many other uh, different uh, condition that requires creativity and also uh, practice and learning. This is what we have. Even the bulbo process could be also uh, repaired by one stage repair. We could do a dorsal only bocomacosal graft ventral penile skin flap, and also anastomos the urethra. So this is um, what we do in a uh, barber urethral necrosis. This complex condition 
could be repaired in one stage repair because basically two stage repair it's uh, could be uh, we should we should inform the patient there is no two stage repair but we have to inform them it could be a stage repair it could be two three or even more so this is uh, our uh, one of our case in 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 Malang and what about in more complex conditions sometimes you cannot have uh, the privilege to have a long surgery so in a very complex condition, it's not the stricture itself, but the condition of the patients where the patient have a heart problem, uh, uh, diabetic, uh, obese, and the history of urethrotomy. This is what we have in Malang. Uh, the, this patient comes with a, a severely lower urinary tract symptoms with an infected uh, urethra. We did a cystostomy, but after we do cystostomy and urethral rest, the urethra is just uh, practically uh, 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 severely uh, in, uh, injured. So what we do, one stage repair is perineal urethrostomy. It has a 97% of success rate. And there's a data from uh, the TURNS group, the urinary and sexual function after perineal urethrostomy for urethrostrictor disease. The patient reported improvement in urinary function after perineal urethrostomy with no uh, effect on sexual function. So patients are happy, but I only do this uh, techniques, this perineal urethrostomy in selected patients. Most of the patient is, could be repaired uh, with one stage uh, uh, surgery. So in the conclusion, most strictures, also pina, could be repaired by one stage repair. Stage repair is limited in complex pina stricture, like uh, Dr. Ahadri said, and perineal urethrostomy is also an option for the older patients with high morbidity risk. A comprehensive knowledge and training is needed to improve the success rate of urethral reconstructive surgery. So once again, I would like to uh, thanks uh, Dr. Kulkarni, uh, Dr. Joshi, and also uh, Yudolto, uh, Dr. Nitesh, Dr. Anil. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's good to be here. I hope soon enough we could meet each other again in person like we had a nice dinner in Bali, which Pankaj missed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paksi. And uh, uh, what's very interesting to note in our Zoom meeting and the Alto meeting is when we had Keith, it was night time. When I'm looking at Stella, I can see the morning sunlight uh, through our window. Indonesia and India, where we are, we can see a bright noon, mid noon happening. And in Devang, uh, we can see the evening come and the curtains are all dark. So. Amazing. So we have connected the whole globe. Correct? Perfect. 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 So uh, I'm just going to give a short talk uh, about flaps. Uh, uh, not going to stress so much because uh, everyone has covered a lot. So as far as flaps is concerned, we can use it as a part of a urethral reconstruction or we can use it as a part of interposition. So when it comes to substitution in bulbar necrosis, we can have an orandi flap in the penile region. We can have a pedicle prepucial tube or a cube flap. From the perineum, we can harvest a scrotal flap or a Singapore flap and most recently lotus flap developed by Chavan and uh, Justin. And then we have Professor Mundy's uh, contribution of enterourethroplasty. When it comes to interposition in rectourethral fistulas, uh, we commonly use gracilis and omental flap. The main difference between a Mackinich flap or an Asopa flap or a pedicle prepucial flap is that the orientation is vertical versus an orandi flap where the orientation is horizontal. So orandi is best suited for penile urethra while the asopa flap is more suited uh, for in general about any urethral length. And I remember Professor Kulkarni once used it intra-abdominally when we had a patient of a high riding prostate with bulbar necrosis. We all know about necrosis. Uh, it happens due to a trauma and injury to the dorsal penile artery or an improper pubectomy is done. And that's why professor always says, use a sharp dissection to separate the corpora and do not use the knife in a curved fashion or else you will damage the dorsal penile artery. The commonest flap that I'm gonna describe is a pedicle prepucial tube in the Asian continent, especially in India, we are lucky. The patients have prepuce. If they don't have, you can use the distal penile skin. This patient was tattooing his hand and thighs because they had already used the free forearm flap and a thigh flap. He still had a bulbal necrosis and was unable to void. He was actually one of our patients in a live urethroplasty workshop in 2016. So made a midline perineal incision. There is practically no bulbar urethra. Normally we see a sponge. This patient had complete loss. 
we could not even see the visible part of the previous flaps in the surgery we have done a deep pubectomy you can see a nice pink and supple posterior urethra this dissection is very easy because uh, there is only scar tissue in the perineum now i'm marking the pedicle prepucial flap in all when we are analyzing the data recently we have done 162 of them in the last uh, two decades but mainly in the last five years so this is an outer penile incision or an outer circumcision incision just below the skin and so we are not going to go uh, deeper to the dartos the initial dissection is going to be between the skin and the underlying dartos tissue uh, uh, it's always uh, well said but uh, that surgery works by the principle of traction and counter traction and i think it's very handy when it comes to making a flap this is where you require the help of your colleagues to hold the outer skin and then you can just dissect in an avascular plane it is also uh, uh, important to record this videos we have the 4k recording and recently we tweeted about the quality of 4k photograph so you can see each and every small vein that is going to the outer skin is preserved so that we do not have necrosis of the outer skin once it is there on the penis so this is just a blunt dissection done dorsally and ventrally and we have to go till the penoscrotal junction or the pre big area <clears throat> any bleeders can be coagulated uh, with a cautery either monopolar or bipolar now this is a inner circumcision incision and this is going to be deeper to the dartos tissue so this dissection is in going to be in between the dartos and the bux fascia as we know that the bux fascia is adherent uh, to the corpora so it is very easy to dissect just over the bux fascia Uh, an important trick is not to stretch the graft at, at the flap at this moment, or else the dartos actually comes out of the inner skin. So do not allow your colleagues to pull the flap when you are doing this inner dissection. This recording I remember was done by Alex Cavena, who was visiting us uh, from Canada during that years. So the dissection goes down again to the penoscrotal region. we can see the mobilized prepuce on its dartos flap uh, you should be uh, happy reading the original paper from john hunter in 1968 regarding the anatomy of the prepuce and the blood supply it all comes dorsally so we have incised the flap ventrally so we have the prepuce mobilized as a vascular flap we going to take it down to the perineum you can swing it from the right side or the left side we are going to mark an incision in between the inner and outer skin so according to the paper from hunter the outer skin has much robust blood supply in a prepuce as compared to inner skin so we cannot use both at a time so we have to sacrifice one and i am just going to make a dissection in between the two edges of the inner and outer skin we leave the skin intact on 14 all silicon catheter is passed and then we make uh, sutures at the edges uh, professor kulkarni has taught me that at the edges we always take interrupted sutures two reasons just in case the tube is long which usually doesn't happen because the referrals to us are complex you can transect and while doing anastomosis there is no risk that the knot will give up so the anastomosis will hold well this is a simple subcuticular suturing uh, the best suture material is a 50 polydiaxone it runs through very nicely and now we are just going to excise the remnant of the inner skin you can see the small bleeding points which also proves that the flap is vascular so once we have a tube that is made we are going to do a proximal anastomosis we take six sutures 11 1 3 6 9 o'clock and 7 o'clock position and this is a completed anastomosis we uh, we then do the distal anastomosis we have we usually keep the catheter for 6 weeks and the longest patient that we have had is when professor operated in 96 <coughs> he still comes for a follow up 87. 87 so he still comes for a follow up other short video 2 minutes clip i'm going to show is uh, one of the commonest flap uh, is the gracilis flap uh, it's very commonly used in plastic surgery as a urologist we should have less inhibition harvesting it This is a patient of a rectourethral fistula after a pelvic fracture. 
so uh, this is a beautiful view where you are putting a finger in the rectum and demonstrate the fistula what is the difference between a urologist and an onco surgeon who is a colleague who helps us is that he takes an unabsorbed non absorbable suture so it's a proline suture as well as using the same suture to reconstruct the anal sphincter so this is a marking of the gracilis flap you go 8 cm below the line joining the anterior superior spine and the medial epicondyle of the tibia you go two finger breadths below and when you make an incision you will be directly onto the gracilis muscle a gracilis muscle has three blood supplies the proximal is the dominant pedicle while the distal to our non dominant pedicle this patient was uh, is is tall and so rather than making one long incision there is also a technique of making multiple small incisions so we have disconnected the tendon we just going to dissect and pull through and then do a gentle dissection remove it from its overlying fascia till we reach the proximal pedicle this is the most distal pedicle which we have to sacrifice the location of the proximal pedicle is usually 8 cm from the inguinal line so this is sharp dissection but a very slow one using scissors so one is an onco surgeon and one is a urologist this is a simultaneous dissection that you are seeing for the proximal pedicle we have to uh, really uh, have a look at it some people use doppler but the best way that we have learned in india is to see it so i'm going to show you a 4k photograph you can see a beautiful pedicle which is preserved and once we have reached this we just swing the pedicle uh, gracilis muscle into the perineum and then use it as an interposition for recto urethral fistula so we we had the opportunity uh, to do 15 of them last year in spite of covid time i think the complex patients traveled a lot and uh, the commonest indication was pelvic fracture but also post radiation issues after prostate cancer and recto urethral fistula fall and, and anal surgery so uh, this is all about uh, doing a correct way of mobilizing the gracilis and using it as an interposition tissue we also know that uh, uh, our colleagues have used buccal graft over the gracilis so it is also versatile enough but it becomes little bulky and the majority of the time we use it as is uh, interposition so uh, this is one important innovation uh, which came from the kulkarni institute uh, for which i want to speak for about a minute is a rare combination in the world where uh, sir is a urologist started with laparoscopy and his wife is one of the pioneers in laparoscopy so while professor barbagli was visiting us what we did is uh, uh, sir did a dissection in the perineum simultaneously madam used laparoscopic ports so she is very used to the anatomy for doing an inguinal hernia which is a tap and a tap repair so once you enter the abdomen just lateral to the bladder you make an incision you are going to enter the retroperitoneal space so what we do is uh, we do a deep pubectomy and over the urethra that is a posterior urethra we pass a tvt needle which comes inside the abdomen we then dilate this tract three ways of dilating is either use a right angle forceps and just open it we can use a suction or we have passed a guide wire and used teflon dilators that are there for pcnl and once this tract is dilated we just mobilize the omentum and push the omentum down into perineum wrap it around we have done 14 cases two were children and uh, uh, this is a wonderful technique so without having to do a dissection in the abdomen and a total pubic approach or an abdominal approach we can have the omentum mobilized uh, i i thank you all uh, for joining across the nations uh, keeping everyone awake early and late till midnight and i'm sure uh, people are going to have going to enjoy this program because we have such a versatile uh, speakers from across the globe thank you professor kulkarni for your comments so panka panka ji we thank the ulto group for uh, arrange, arranging a fantastic program today pankaj took lot of efforts to uh, uh, have our friends across the world at different time zones and the lectures are really good paksi um, faisal and you speaking about for one stage multi stage and then uh, flaps so we have almost covered all the aspects of um, urethral surgery uh, i thank all the presenters and i we will give it to 
Ulto again to thank the audience and the speakers again. Thank you very much. I, I think one common thing uh, in this program has been all our lives have been touched by Professor Kulkarni in some point of our careers. You all have been here. He has been to many places and uh, we really owe it because of such a guru. Uh, we, all, uh, we all are there in a program delivering a lecture and we also have the lineage from Professor Mandi. We have Stella. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Nitesh or uh, Dr. Anil Takwani to have closing comments uh, from the Alto group. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, Pankaj, uh, uh, we are on behalf of Ulto, Urology Learning Through Others Experience. We are extremely thankful to you and uh, Professor Kulkarni, sir, for uh, making this possible. In uh, this uh, extremely difficult time, uh, having uh, such a extremely talented faculties from across the world, and that is, uh, we are understanding the timing. And this is not the recorded, this is live participation. And that is uh, uh, at the odd time, specifically for those who participate from the Canada, Australia, UK, and from across the world. So this is unbelievable experience for all of us. And uh, it's a complete uh, treat uh, uh, regarding the stricture urethra. We are extremely enlightened with the very precise, very uh, insightful uh, talks and extremely, once again, thankful to both of you to make this possible. With that, we are sincerely thankful to all the faculties, those who have participated from across the world to enlighten us. Uh, sir, uh, we would like to see all of you once again uh, in, on this particular platform. With that, uh, I also thank uh, Nitesh uh, for making this possible, taking the Pankaj uh, and Kulkani sir in the fold and convincing this uh, Convene this meeting. So, extremely once again thankful on behalf of urology learning through others' experience. The complete recording will be available and it will be sent to all of the participants uh, along with the participation certificate from the Nites. So, Nites, uh, a final few words from you and then we can have uh, some specific comments from the participants and their experience. Nites. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Anil, sir, is one of the key force behind the behind the entire ent academic program on ULTE as well as Euro Academy. And as rightly said by Kulkarni sir, there is no debate. You need to select the right indication. You need to select the right indication for a stricture urethra. Today, we had nine enlightening talks from urologists from across the globe. And uh, I'm sure with all this talk, everyone will get enlightened. And the success rate of one of the most common urological procedure will increase further. With this, uh, with this, I would like to thank Pankaj sir for his special effort. He have gathered nine uh, nine speakers from across the globe from different time zones with odd hours, and he is, he was able to convince all of them to come on Facebook. I my special thank to Pankaj sir for this, and uh, Kulkarni sir as always. He is the maestro in urethroplasty, and uh, and his comments are always words of wisdom for each and every one of us. I request all of you to be part of Ulta family so that you can guide us through the journey of learning and spreading knowledge. Thank you all and thanks once again. And any comments from any would speakers? like to have uh, some comment from the participants and their experience. Uh, speakers, anything they want to convey, specifically Kulkani, sir? No, no, I, I had my comments. I want Devang and Paksi to, to say a few words. Look, I would like to say that this is uh, a great meeting and it's uh, really amazing to have this sort of opportunity and platform to share our views and learn from others in these difficult times of uh, the COVID. Thankfully, uh, in Australia and New Zealand, we've been very lucky, but we feel for the rest of the world suffering from these uh, calamities. And I wish that at some stage that we all can catch up again in person. Uh, and thank you for the kind invitation. Thank you. And as for me, this is a very nice uh, moment where in the frustrating couple of years, I could not meet our uh, family, the Recon family in person. So every time we have the opportunity to share our knowledge, our experience in whatever platform, it's a great, uh, it's a great time for me, basically. 
So thank you very much for Ulto, for Dr. Anil, Dr. Uh, Nitesh. It's a great honor for me to be here. And thank you very much again to our guru, because Dr. Kulkarni basically has touched our uh, professional life and our, our life, not only in uh, urology, in reconstructive surgery, but I learned a, a lot about life from our guru, Professor Kulkarni. Thank you very much uh, for having me here. Thank you, Thank Paxi. You Paxi, I remember you last year uh, at Dhaka, we met uh, yeah. in one of these uh, annual meetings of the Bangladesh. Dhaka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Evelyn, so, Evelyn? Yeah, sir. Evelyn, did you enjoy? Your mic is off. I enjoyed so much to see everyone, the family again. This has been a great reunion. And yeah, it actually makes one to, to be grounded again. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you. Stella? Yes, Stella. Hi. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. It was really lovely to catch up with everyone. And it was a really nice summary of different techniques used for um, urethral problems. So I thought it was a really nice little series. Thank you also for including female speakers. I'm, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, we have too many panels still in urology that are all male. And please, please, let's work on this and get uh, more female speakers. I really appreciate you including us and uh, uh, let's let's do some more. Thank you. Thank you. So every every two weeks, Stella used to watch and ask, how are you? How is Professor Kulkarni and how is India? So hats off to you for that dedication. <laughs> Thank you. Akio? Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was very great honor. And uh, I'm looking forward to meeting meet you all uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very Hopefully much. Hopefully in the winter we could visit Japan. Information, the urology learning yes. through others experience is having more than now 8,000 members. With that Euro Academy, the small baby having more than now 1,100 members. And uh, most of the time uh, they either uh, stay live with us in the program or subsequently we post, uh, post this uh, recording and we go on getting the comments. And uh, most of the time Dr. Josie and Dr. Kurkani uh, gives the adequate responses to these uh, viewers. So thank you all viewers, uh, those who joined. And with that, I think it is, if there is no more, uh, nothing more, no more, this we can Last follow. comment by Arun Chawla. Dr. Uh, Dr. Chawla, you are there. Sir, you are unmute as well as we would like to see you. Yeah, correct. Most probably he is in another ISU meeting because the USA has their activity. So okay. I think because he conveyed to me and uh, it was a very short time that he said, but no matter whenever you do, I want to join. So it was very happy. To have. So I so, think he must be busy in some meeting. Anil Takwani and um, Ulto Group. Yes, hmm? sir. Fantastic, fantastic job. Thank you all. So Thanks. good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night to everyone on the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye, everyone. Stay safe. Stay Thank, safe. You, Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very Thank much. You. Once again, putting this effort. Thank right. you. Dr. Nitesh, Dr. Anil, thank you very much. Devan, bye-bye. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye, Evelyn. Bye. Bye, Paxi. Bye. 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 Bye